Okay, so our next speaker is Peter Bissaro, who's the founder and CSO of Feedside, which does real-time uh, event processing. And his talk is about real-time product mission and activity monitoring. Okay, uh, thank you for attending my, my talk. Um, I'm actually a PhD student in those exciting times that uh, Mike Franklin was talking about uh, a little while ago. I was from Wisconsin, I'm also one of the guys that from that time ended up starting a company that is doing real-time data processing, and that's my background, so I'm not really a machine learning guy. But in the, um, so, and as Mike said, we believe that uh, really the, the, the future of these tools is the ones that are integrating streaming and, and the historical data, which is what, what we do what we do here with FISI Pulse. And also, uh, lately we've been integrating as well the, um, the real-time machine learning part. So let me start this. OK, so in this talk, I'm going to present a pro project that we did uh, a while ago about credit card fraud detection. Uh, so how do you stop um, credit card fraud? So, one technique uh, is using um, rules uh, or, or some sort of, of machine learning technique that some way encodes um, this abnormal behavior which we are trying to model, which is fraud. For example, typical rules that we see being applied in practice are things like if the user does the number of transactions, for example, three transactions in less than one hour over one $1,000, then block the transaction. Um, so the problem is that the world is, is messy. It's messy because fraud varies a lot from person to person. So maybe a teenager spends most of his transactions for books and music and food and drinks. The business guy. Um, does much more hotels and travels and, and cars and so on. And maybe the old lady uh, spends more in, in local co commerce and, and stuff for, for her pets. And actually, if you account for, for how the different channels, how people spend the money, it's even uh, more complicated. As someone was just saying now, uh, on the web, things are a, a little bit different. So maybe the on, on the web, we spend more money or spend on online casinos or spend on uh, some sort of gambling stuff that probably we don't do in real life. And maybe in real life, with a physical card, you go always to the same stores, the same <coughs> neighborhood, and online you have much more variety and different amounts and so on. So, how do they protect uh, in reality the, the usage? So there's a number of, of protection structures in credit cards that of course, the the, the number of the credit card, the PIN number, the name of the person, the address, the zip code. There's a CVV code, those little three digits on, on the back of the card. Um, there's a signature, and very importantly, there's the chip. Uh, actually, the, the chip is the most uh, safe technique to protect the card, uh, and it is forced to be used in, in Europe, but actually it's not forced to be used um, elsewhere, so it doesn't work as well as it should because of that because it's not mandatory. And what type of frauds uh, are there? So let me introduce a little bit of, of terminology and, and type of fraud in this one slide. So skimming is what we, we call to the act of actually stealing the information from the card, like the, the number and the pin. Maybe it's not the complete information, but it's information enough to, to then go and, and do a counterfeit card. So duplicate or clone a card that can be used somewhere else. Maybe that cloned card is not even made of plastic. Sometimes they clone cards out of paper. Uh, maybe they are trying to, to be more green or something, but uh, <laughs> or, or just saving money. But sometimes they clone the cards in paper and they use them on, on gas pumps and stuff like that, far away from the merchant. Um, there's also stolen and lost cards. And the reason I'm telling you these several types of fraud is because the behavior of fraud also varies a lot from the type of fraud that started uh, the situation. For example, a stolen card or a lost card 
when it's misused, is used very quickly. So in the, in the very next hours, the, the bad guy will max out the car. Very frequently does that. Tests the car, and then if it goes through, it just starts spending money very quickly. On the other hand, if the car was not delivered, or if it was stolen before it got to the person, maybe the person was not even aware that there was a, a car in transit uh, to his address, uh, and will not complain to the bank sometimes, even if it gets late, one week or two weeks or a couple of months even, because it was just not expecting the new car in the, the map. Uh, so we see that the usage is, is very, very different in that situation. Also, when the card is stolen before it's used uh, by the real user, it's very hard to come up with a, a correct profile because we don't know the history of the usage of that person. And there's, then there's also application fraud when someone opens an account uh, in your name, uh, probably with some fake elements like the, the address or something, uh, and keeps on using the card until it maxes out the, the platform. There's many more types of fraud, but these, these are enough for now. And then there's two main types of card usage, which is what they call CNP and CP, so card not present and card present. Card not present is whatever you do when you're buying stuff on the web, on Amazon or eBay, so the card is not physically present in, in the place of, of, the, of the purchase. And card present is whenever you go to a physical store or restaurant or something where you have and you don't the card, and you put the card in the machine, or you swipe the card somewhere. In terms of distribution uh, for the client, we were working, and I apologize, because I have many numbers covered here, and many slides simplified, because this had uh, gone through the, the company, my client, and they, they didn't allow many things to be published. I, I even have an architecture slide coming up, which is just a single box. I cannot show the architecture, uh, but by the by the size of the of the black rectangle, you can see the scale of the. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he allowed me for that. So you see that the transactions run in the in the millions per day. The suspected fraud runs in the thousands per day, uh, and the true fraud runs in the tens of of true fraud transactions per day. They actually have a a system of computer person person to, to detect fraud. Um, in some cases, it's stopped automatically uh, by computers using those rules that I showed before. Frequently, a computer just flags something as suspicious and there goes for a first level um, uh, where people are analyzing the transactions and seeing if it's fraud or not, and then it goes to a second level and probably they will make a phone call to decide. Um, to decide if it's really fraud or not. So although there are very few transactions, um, there are many million um, in terms of, of losses per year, and almost all of that is for the car not present uh, kind of fraud. How do the, the, the bad guys get your car in the first place? So one technique, and this is getting uh, common, is somehow they, they rig an ATM machine. Uh, and a common scenario is they put a, a very thin, very small, uh, uh, you almost don't notice, but a very small scanner inside the card slot. So whenever you put the card inside the machine, you're also putting the card inside the, the scanner. And then they have on top of the machine uh, something that looks, that comes from a, a 007, uh, movie or, or a Mission Impossible level, tiny little cameras on top of the machine. This happens, especially in like crowded places with lots of tourists like uh, Venice and stuff like that. They really have these things in place. And even, even if they get just five or, or six good cars per day, they actually are doing that. So they are getting your, your pin codes from the, when you type them. So whenever you use a car, cover the pin. If it's an ATM machine, you might think that your body is covering the, the pin, but maybe there's, there's something else trying to get the, the code. Do the same in a gas pump and everywhere. Always cover. cover. Uh, I, right now, I, I think I can uh, do that without even looking at it. Uh, after working with these guys, I got super annoyed about credit card accounting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Another technique is kind of strange, but we, we start to saw an increase on that, is that whenever you go to a store, sometimes the car that they return to you is not the same car you give to them. So this happens normally uh, for uh, banks that have a wash percent of, of customers in one area, like everybody has a Bank of America card or something like that. They, they kind of look and feel all the same. They have the same reddish color or something. And so the guy on the other side of the counter maybe has like 20 or 30 cards and quickly sees, oh, this is a Bank of America card and gives you a bag. You're full of bags in your hand. You don't even realize what goes, goes on. You don't look at the card to see if your name is there. You just put the card in the wallet. You never think about that again. You only realize a couple of days later or, or in the next store that something is wrong. And when you go back, you, the person says, I don't know, you, you paid, I give you the card. Um, and another technique is um, you go to a store and they have a scanner somewhere. And, and typically, they have very small scanners, like so some of these scanners. Sometimes they are even in their, their pens and they just get you give them the card and they just like hold for one second or two like with a card close to their pants and, or they just swipe it quickly and they just copy the card on the support. So they just skim the information from the card. So if you can, keep an eye on the card at all times. For example, in, in Europe now, they bring the machine to the card. They don't take the card to the machine to avoid those kind of, of schemes. And then there's additional business complications. Um, the, the chip, which is the, the strongest way to protect the card and which was actually forced by, by Visa and MasterCard that all, all merchants in Europe must have uh, a little device that is able to read the chip. It, although it's forced in Europe, it's not forced anywhere else. So what's happening a lot is that European cards are being cloned and then used somewhere else in, a, in other countries. For example, uh, there's networks of, uh, of these uh, bad guys that they somehow clone a card, so they, they are not able to clone the chip. They, they are able to clone the, the number of the card, and they, yeah, they get your pin somehow. Then they send those numbers, they sell those numbers to uh, some other guy somewhere that make the counterfeit cards, and then they synchronize the usage of the card. So they will probably start using the card in the same day, in the same hour, in the same minute, in three different continents. One guy in Australia, another guy in Brazil, another guy in the US, because they know that Visa and MasterCard have a system that when you're abroad, because it takes too long to verify the card, some cards just allow you to cash in some money even without checking with the bank. So there's a local check there. So they just start in using the same card uh, to max out the card in the three or four different locations. When they are done with the car, they know that it will never work again. They throw away the car and they start using the next from the pile. They do that like 20 or 30 cars in a row to mix out all the, all of the cards. <coughs> the other thing is that, that makes this very challenging is that fraud is always evolving. So, for example, it will, there were lots of, of fraud in Europe which start going to different countries because of, of the chip. And, and now there's interesting temporal patterns, for example. We now know that after the Brazilian Carnival in, in Brazil in, in February, there's a, an increase in fraud in March in the, in the US and Australia because the, all the tourists that went to Brazil, some of them got the cards stolen, cloned cards were made and started being used a couple of weeks later in other countries. <coughs> Okay, so the other uh, technical complication is that the scale of the problem is very, very big. So there's tens of millions of cards with billions of transactions to be considered. And if you really want to detect fraud in real time, you need to do that clearly sub-second uh, times, typically at the millisecond level. So this was the contest that our client uh, came up with us. Uh, so the goals 
for, for, for us, for this project, was to improve uh, kernel presence fraud, so to detect kernel presence fraud, and to build a, a semi-continuously learning system that you could uh, frequently relearn. Um, and it should be able to scale nation, nationwide in terms of number of cars and history and response time. So what did we do? Well, we redefined fraud in the following sense. We, just said, we said, well, the usage of fraud is very so much from person to person and from online and not online and from car to car that the only way for us to really define fraud is to look at the typical behavior of that car, that individual car. So we decided to, to build a per car profile, which as you imagine, implies uh, millions and millions of profiles. And, and focus on unseen transactions because they were the most costly. And then we transform the problem into a classification problem with supervised learning. So we had all, all the transactions that were classified as fraud, first by the, the users of the cars and also by the bank and by Visa and MasterCard uh, for a number of months. And we used them to, to, to supervise, uh, 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 learn and test a number of algorithms. The components of our system, at least some of them, the one that I'm showing, a couple that I'm not showing. Um, so we use uh, our engine uh, Pulse, the real-time engine, to, to the, do the parsing of the elements, to compute some statistics, to route everything, to coordinate the other components. And then periodically, we compute the profiles on Hadoop, uh, so basically those large map-reduced jobs uh, for each car, we look to the history of the cars and we summarize everything about the car, like the top 10 countries, the top 10 merchants, the most common values, the time of the day, the day of the week, the, the physical ID of the ATM machines uh, or of the, of the sites online. So we have about 200 variables per, per card stored in a profile. And then we store that profile in Cassandra to, to be able to give us very fast um, response times. And, and this is the, the architecture slide that actually doesn't show anything. Um, it's just that one box. Uh, but this is what I'm allowed to show. Um, so the point is we were tracking, um, in this case, uh, 80 million cars cards for kernel present transactions, all the other transactions we were letting it go through. The peak uh, that we were able to sustain uh, was 1,200 transactions per second. I can tell you that in reality it was much lower than that, but we tested the system to, to go to these uh, bandwidths. Uh, and the latency was just below milliseconds per transaction. Um, and the algorithms were supposed to, to return a score between zero and, uh, and 1,000. So we consider a very high number of algorithms. Altogether, were like 25 algorithms or so that were implemented using Weka, um, both for learning and then for scoring. And then after uh, three or four months of testing, we ended up uh, choosing cost-sensitive uh, knife base, uh, gave us uh, very good results, and was also faster to relearn than the other algorithms. As, as for feature, uh, what we ended up using was essentially the deviations between the transaction and the norm. So we, we knew the norm for each card because we had a profile and we saw, well, if this guy is spending much more than the norm or in a different country or in a different kind of merchant, then we are going to report that uh, to our classifier. We also included other, other elements like the, the amounts, how was the the transaction being validated, if you have a CVV code or not, zip code or not, and so on, and if it was coming from a risk country or not. To test this, we have uh, we used six months of data, uh, including 12 million transactions, and then we tried it with uh, three months of data with four million transactions. Uh, you can note that we didn't try for July and August because that behavior was very different there, and even our client told us not to test with those months because the fraud is 
so very different in the summer that it, it would be unfair for our, our, our reason. So, but in the end, we, we ended up um, with great results. 75% of the fraud was detected. I can tell that this was more than twice um, what was previously being detected by the previous system because this includes not only the fraud detected by the previous system as well as the fraud reported by the user and reported by Visa and MasterCard. So we were able to detect fraud even before the user saw something on, on the uh, on the bank statement. And we were able to do this in 1.5 seconds on average per, per card. Also, the, the algorithm was good enough that we were able to retrain uh, and, and run this in, a, in Hadoop and then store it in Cassandra. Uh, historical of six months in just, <coughs> just 24 hours. And this is it. Uh, I'd like to have showing you more more details, more juicy stuff, but I couldn't. Um, but I'm open for questions now. Thank you. By the way, we are hiring. Hi, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, can I say you process 1,200 cards per second? So how much data per card and where's the bottleneck? Because there are computer genomics out there that process 1,000 cards a second. So I was curious if you could uh, elaborate more on that. So the bottleneck was uh, was the I.O. getting stuff um, to to Cassandra and to, to Eka, although Stuff was in memory. We had a 96 gig machine uh, in terms of, of RAM. That, that was the bottleneck. Um, I, but in practice, our client very rarely even has more than 200 transactions per second. So we just uh, benchmark that to see if you could get to those numbers. But for example, last Christmas, I think the, the top they had was like 200 per second. That's even close to. I wonder if you can um, say something about your ROC curve. And uh, you know, yesterday we heard, in the context of um, you know, triggers in, inside of an ICU, that essentially every single real trigger had to be acted upon. And so effectively, they were following up on a lot of false positives. Yes. Uh, I imagine that there's a major cost yes. as well for following up on false positives, because then you have to get people calling other people and it's, it's, it adds to the cost of the whole system. So are you providing an ROC curve to your customers, or are you basically giving them a zero, one, yes or no? I guess the, the zero, 99, is big. Exactly. Flag. So we're giving them a score between one and 999. And actually, that's what their current system already is doing. And they, they do have <coughs> lots and lots of false positives. Uh, it's like one true positive for each 60 false uh, positives. That's why they have this um, layer of people just looking at those at those uh, possible alarms and deciding in a couple of minutes if it's uh, a true fraud or not. About of, of those uh, false negatives, they, they are able to decide like 90% of that in the first layer, and 10% of them they cannot decide and go to the second layer, where someone actually will make phone calls and look more history of the car or, or the merchant and so on. So we were able not to improve much more in terms of false positives. We did improve a little bit, but what we improved much, much more was the, the number of true positives. So are, are, are you privy to the, um, the, the relabeling of, of all the ones that are false positives? It's one out of 60 or 59 of those essentially getting fed back in the system so you can read learn features that are important that you're missing? Yes, they are feedback into the system, yes. So they would count for us as, as non-positive. And, and I guess the last question really all this, are, are you actually being told what the cost function is and the loss function uh, for giving them you know, false positives? Or do you know the numbers? Because obviously, uh, if somebody's buying a car, um, you'd imagine the size of the transaction uh, you know, could also wind up being an important factor in what you wind up wanting to call uh, false or not, right? 
well, you would be surprised to see the stuff people buy, uh, that they, they think it's okay, and that they don't declare as fraud, and the amount of people that get really offended if you call them, uh, what, you're tracking me? What do I care if I'm buying a $20,000 ring, one and then the other? I don't care, I don't want you calling me. So, so we, have, we have lots of people like, like that, that uh, there are actually a, a, a special list in the bank that transactions from this guy, regardless, will always go through, regardless. And he has some, some strange purchases, very expensive, and they always go through. And sometimes one of these people in the white list uh, complains, uh, oh, by the way, uh, my ex-wife was using my card for the last six months, and I want to cancel everything. It's like half a million. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff do happen. But the sort of genesis of class stuff, you're actually quantifying, the companies are quantifying for you, and that's like, they're actually telling you the loss function. Yeah, exactly, they are, with the white lists and, and the black lists. Um, you said that you um, have poor card profiles and you perform supervised learning. And I just wonder, um, I think for, for the majority of the cards, you would not have positive examples for, for fraud, so how do you, how do, you do that? Do you, do you Say that again, for what kind of cards? For the majority of the cards, you don't have positive examples for fraud. So how do you perform supervised learning when you do not have positive examples? Or do you exploit the similarity between the profiles? Or Oh, for, for the majority of the, the cars, you, you really don't have fraud, as you say. Uh, so yes, you imply similarity measures, and it's typically a distance between uh, your typical transaction and this new transaction. And if it's in a, a risky merchant, and if it's in a risky country, and if it's in a strange time of the day, it gets a, a much higher score. By the way, one of the rules that works best is detecting if a card is being used at the same time in two countries, so, which <laughs> happens a lot. And actually, they do have tables that tell you, well, from this country to that country, by airplane takes X amount of hours. From this country to that country takes X amount of hours. So if the purchases happen with less that interval, it's marked as fraud. There were an interesting story once where a, a, a cloned car was using, being used in Portugal and then Mexico, Portugal and then Mexico, and the guys didn't know, is this fraud or not? Because it was always like eight hours of difference. It could be that he was taking the plane, traveling to Mexico, doing some purchases and traveling back, and, then, and eventually it was uh, detected as fraud. And it was just the case that the, the guy in Mexico was waking up much later because of the time difference <laughs> and was being lucky for a number of weeks. What's the hardest type of fraud to detect? Uh, well, it's uh, when the guy that's spending has a similar profile to you, so he doesn't do anything outrageous. He just trickles little uh, purchases, not really expensive, though will fly under the radar. Okay, let's thanks for your game.